thank you so much that you have allowed us to know the truth. You have allowed us to come to this house of truth. And you didn't leave us, you didn't forsake us like you promised. Cause us to walk worthy of that call, Lord. Knowing that you picked us, you handpicked us and pulled us out of a deep, dark pit. Cause us to never lose sight of that and to never lose gratefulness and thankfulness to you for what you've done. In Jesus' name. Oh, my goodness, man. God is so good. I'm telling you, man, I, I, it baffles me so much to see people get set completely free. Let's see if I can get my glasses on. There we go. So you get set completely free from all kinds of bondages, addiction, drugs, alcohol, um, lust, perversion, all kinds of stuff. Get completely set free, healed, delivered, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, praying in tongues, slain in the spirit, laughing with the joy of the Lord, and then to go back. I, I'm, you know, it's, it's baffling how you can get a, a taste of heaven and, and fall back go back to that same old miserable, grimy, terrible, wretched life. It's sad. It's very, very sad. Um, unfortunately, we know a lot of people that, that fall into that trap. Um, we've seen a lot of people fall into that trap. Um, we know a lot of people that are out there using again. We know a lot of people that have died um, that were once set free. Um, and we know that that is not the desire of our Father in heaven. That is not his will for us. That is not his will for them. And I think a lot of times people take it for granted. They get comfortable. They get complacent. They get prideful. They get arrogant. And they think they've learned something when you don't know anything without him. The only reason you have learned anything is because there's been a mind exchange. There's been an exchange of your old mind for the mind of Christ. And that is something that we have to grab hold of. Everything you think of that is good, it's him. It's him. It's not you. It all comes from him. Everything you do that is good, it comes from him. So there's no room for you to take pride when you know it's got nothing to do with you. I'm telling you, there's things that happen in my life. I can't even deny the fact that it's God. I know that I'm not smart enough to do some of the things that he has me do. I'm thinking, Lord, I am an idiot. How is this even possible to be taking place in my life? It's him. That's the only way the impossible becomes possible. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the anointing. That's it. If you can grab a hold of that, there's no room for pride. There's no room for arrogance. And there's no room to go back to the old life. Let's start off in uh, 1 John 5. You know, again, um, there's not one person that comes to this house um, that came by coincidence. It's no coincidence that you came here. It's no coincidence that God led you here. Um, whether you believe it or not, you were called, you were chosen, you were handpicked. I've heard people say, oh, this place isn't for me. I need a different place or something that's more, uh, more in tune with who I am. That's the voice of the stranger. If God sent you here, it's for a reason. It's because you have a call, a purpose, and a destiny to be a mighty warrior for the kingdom of God and to cause other individuals out there to become mighty warriors for the kingdom of God. That's why you're here. So if you think that it was a mistake, you think that you showed up here on accident, go ahead and silence that lie and receive your call and see it all the way through. We have been blessed beyond measure to be in a house that doesn't care about your feelings. They're going to give you the cold, hard truth because we care about your soul. We care about your destiny. We care about your children's souls. We care about your children's destinies. We care about seeing you at home sitting with the Father. If your feelings get hurt, I'm not sorry. They need to get hurt so they can die and you can come to the true reality of who you are, which is a mighty warrior for the kingdom of heaven. That's who you are. 
So all the feelings and all the emotions and all the woes is me, these and all that stuff, that, that stuff is for the old man. You sever it, you step into the new, and you kick the devil's butt. Take dominion over your life. Take dominion over your children's life and your family line. Amen? 1 John 5, 18. So we know, we, all of us here, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. All right, so we see there that obviously we're going to make mistakes, but there are requirements in order to keep yourself pure, to keep yourself righteous, to keep yourself holy. There's things that you have to maintain. There's things that you have to do in order for the enemy to not be able to touch you. doesn't mean you just come to know the Lord and all of a sudden you're untouchable. No, there's work that has to be done. There's cooperation that you have to see through. There's routines that you have to stay committed to, and you have to fight the good fight. Amen? God can't do it for you. You have to step in the ring and kick the devil's butt so that the Lord can keep you safe and protected from the enemy and keep him from touching you. So, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Hallelujah. So everybody knows the routine. Everybody knows the righteous requirements. We've learned it. We have an understanding of it. I know, you know when new people come in, that's why it's critical, you know, to, to try and teach them stuff, talk to them about stuff, lead them along. And while they're in the classroom and... And new believers in general, there's an area where you have to come to an understanding of what is going on in the kingdom of heaven. And once you come to that understanding, um, you have to maintain the freedom that you've gained. Amen. Because the devil is always trying to steal, kill, and destroy. There's always a sway from the enemy to try and draw you back to the old. We're going to go to Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. Maintaining our life of freedom, we know that the devil is a tempter. We know that he's a deceiver. We know that he's trying to sway us. We know that he's trying to cause a drift. So we have to make sure that we maintain the mindset that the devil is on attack at all times. So that means we have to make sure and see things through all the way. We have to be first strikers. We have to attack. We have to warfare. And we have to chase after God with everything we have. Half-hearted seeking of the Lord is not going to keep you in the secret place under the wings of his protection. You cannot half step in the kingdom of God, especially not these days. As much evil that is being released in this world, there has to be an increase in righteousness in order to keep free from the increase of evil. Amen? So, first, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 2, verse 1, starting at verse 1. Let's read it. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So we know there's a drift coming. We know there's always a constant drift coming from the enemy. So we know that we have to make sure and take heed of the things that we've learned and heard and be consistent, be obedient, be steadfast, and destroying the plan of the enemy to cause us to drift. You know, there's a, there's a major problem that I've seen for a long time. Um, I've seen, seen it trying to attack me. I've seen it try and attack many people around me. I know many people caught up in it. Um, and it's one of the biggest problems that we have today in people in general and in the body of Christ is they are okay with just being lukewarm. They profess to be God-fearing Christians. They go through the motions of being a Christian. They talk the talk, but they live in the flesh. For people with a lukewarm spirit, 
indulging themselves in the flesh is more important to them than truly living righteously and pleasing God. This is a wildly crazy problem that we have all over the world. And it's, it's sad because in order to be a lukewarm Christian, that means you have to know who Jesus is. It means you've been in the faith, um, which is even more sad because it's people who should know the truth that just choose not to walk in it. They choose to be sidesteppers. They choose to scream hallelujah and say how much they love God and say how much they love worship and say how much they love to serve and they love to do all the things that are righteous. But when pastor's not around or when leadership's not around, they do whatever the heck they want. They say whatever the heck they want. They talk about whatever they want. They act however they want. Then when Somebody in authority is around, oh, hallelujah, to God be the glory, man, I love this place, man, I love church, I love worship, man, I love hearing that music. Behind the scenes, it's cussing, slander, gossip, backbiting, touching this, touching that, that they know they shouldn't be touching. That will not suffice in the kingdom of God. That will not get you home. That is a lukewarm spirit, and it has to be exposed and removed. Now, it doesn't mean that people are not going to make mistakes, but there's an area where there is a heart after the Father, and there is a heart not truly after the Father. Amen? So don't deceive yourself into thinking that, you know, I do all this, I do that, I go to church, I worship, I go through all these motions, because that's what it is, going through the motions of what it looks like to be a Christian. But if you're not even trying to do the right thing in your own time, there's a serious problem there. Amen? And there's an area where people sometimes have never been hot or people have been hot and they have drifted to a place of being lukewarm and allowed through a familiar spirit, a lukewarm spirit to enter in. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today is drift to lukewarm. So let's go to... Uh, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. There's a reason for that, because without that start, there, you can't do anything else to completion. If you can't first start with loving the Lord your God with all your heart and choosing to serve him with all your heart, nothing else is going to take place in your life. It has to begin with a true heart of repentance, a true heart for righteousness, and a true heart for him. Without that, going through the motions will do absolutely nothing for you. There is a chance while you're going through the motions that you may get hit by the Holy Ghost and fire and have a complete heart change. And that's the hope. You know, you see people go through the motions, you let the course run for a period of time, a period of time, but at the end of the day, everybody always exposes themselves. So you can only fake it for a period of time. There is no fake it till you make it in the kingdom. It's fake it till you get exposed or fake it till you turn around. So I encourage you to not fake it. Get real with the Lord. Get real with the people around you. Repent and go after him with everything you have so that you will make it. Because the other way is a gamble. And you don't gamble with the enemy because he's going to kill you. Matthew 25, starting at verse 1. All right, hallelujah. We've heard this probably a, a lot of times. Um, but I saw something in this that I had never really had a revelation of before. Um, so let's read it along. Uh, it says, So the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now I want to stop right there for a minute. So one of the things that stuck out to me was it says the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. All right? It didn't say five virgins and five heathens. It said ten virgins. So we know that virgin in this is a representation of somebody who's been washed clean, somebody who's been redeemed, somebody who's been, who's been freed. So we're talking about ten redeemed believers in this scripture. All right? And it says now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish or what I like to say is lukewarm. They have become lukewarm. Those who were foolish or lukewarm 
took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins who arose and trimmed their lamps, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. <laughs> but the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I, I know that that scripture pretty much speaks for itself, but I think that it's critical that we all make sure and take to what it's actually saying. What it's actually saying is, is you cannot play games with God. You don't know when he's coming. You don't know when he's going to return. And even more than that, the games that you're playing aren't just affecting you. They're affecting people around you. So you're not only messing with your salvation, but you're messing with other people's salvation. Amen? We have got to be mindful of our actions in these times, not only for our freedom, but for other people's freedom. You know, it's a sad thing to see somebody get set free, to see somebody have the opportunity to get completely set free and run because people around them are driving them crazy who shouldn't be driving them crazy because they should be a witness and an example of who God is. And it's high time for people to cut the nonsense and to get in tune with the Lord. There is a call in these times for people to get fired up, to get with God, to seek him with a true and faithful heart, to touch him so that he can touch you and you can be a touch to somebody else. People are playing games with the wrong fire, and it's got to come to an end because you're going to get burned, and not with a Holy Ghost fire. You're going to get burned with the pit fire. Amen? So take this into a place in your mind where it becomes a reality that everything you do, you're held accountable for. Everything you do, you have to answer for. Everything you do is causing something in somebody else's life, causing something in your children's lives, causing something somewhere else just besides yourself. Your decisions are not your own anymore because you know the truth. Let's go to Matthew 5. You know, I see one of the biggest things that... Um, cause people's lights to go out, cause people to drift to, to being lukewarm, and also cause people to never get to a place of actually being hot is rebellion and disobedience. And you know, when, when you say that, some of the first things, especially for us at Total Freedom at the program, but it, it applies for the body of Christ all over the world. Um, rebellion and disobedience to who God has put in their life as spiritual appointed authority you look at that person as a person when you truly need to be looking at that person as a God-appointed authority in your life. God has put spiritual heads in our lives that know better than us. They know more than us. And if you start thinking that they don't know more than you, then you have something called a pride demon. And it needs to be dealt with. God brought us here to learn from him and from the people that he placed in position over us. We have got to learn to trust the routine that God has put us in. Amen. If you can't trust the routine that God put you in with the people that he's called to train you, you're not going to make it. We know that we are idiots. We have tried and failed on numerous occasions. We continue to try and fail on numerous occasions, but yet we still think we know better than everybody else. I don't know how we continue to believe that lie. 
We need help. We need people in this world that know Jesus more than us to help us. So we need to learn to submit to them. Rebellion and disobedience to God's appointed spiritual authority is a major reason why people become lukewarm and fall. And they also cause others to fall. We have to come out of this stuff. We have to take it seriously and stop playing games with it. And this isn't just for this house. This is for God's people globally. People all over the world. Man, I know people all over the place that are proclaimed believers and quoting scriptures just because they don't kick in doors anymore, they don't sell dope anymore, they don't rob anymore, they don't use anymore, they don't drink anymore, they think they're fine and they're going to heaven because they proclaim God as their savior. But they promote and vote for wickedness. They, they cuss. They say things they shouldn't say. They promote things they shouldn't promote. And they think just because they're not doing the things they used to do that they're going home and they're set free. But they're leading people astray. That's the true reality of, of what we're looking at today. Believers are not following. They're leading people away from being true followers. And we have to stop it. We have to stop it. Where did I say to go? Matthew 5, 13. Hallelujah. So it says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, I'm sorry, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Don't let the enemy put your light out. Don't let the enemy use you as a vessel to put somebody else's light out. Matthew 18, 6. One of the most wild tactics that the enemy uses, you know, when he, when he does what he does, he's not thinking about just you. He's thinking about tons of people. We all know that we've been called to get set free so that we can set other people free. Amen? So we know that we're not accountable just for our freedom, for our safety. We didn't get rescued so that we can live a, a happily ever after life, la-di-da, and do whatever we want. We know this. You know, it would be wonderful to go have a house on the beach and have a boat, go fishing every day and do whatever the heck I want every day. But that's not what I've been called to. And that's not what I'm going to go for because I'm going to be miserable in that because I know the truth. So we've got to get in that mindset of who we truly are. We are saved to save. Amen. So in that, from the day you get saved to the time you go home, the devil is trying to prevent that. He's trying to use your mouth. He's trying to use your actions to not only bind you up, but to bind other people around you up. He wants you to be a stumbling block. And the word has something very powerful to say about stumbling blocks. In Matthew 6, I think, no, 18, 6, sorry. Something very powerful and pretty scary. know when everybody's there so we can all read this together. Let it take root. Everybody there? Hallelujah. Matthew 18, 6 says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That's a pretty strong statement. So this is how serious we need to take the witness that we're being. This is how serious we need to take our relationship with the Lord. The only way to maintain these things, the only way to maintain being a good witness and manifesting the character of Christ is to have a divine connection with him and is to truly make the decision to give everything to him, everything. 
every part of your life, everything that you think you have or you think you want, it has to be surrendered to him. You have to go after him with everything you have. We are not victims. There are no excuses, none. No excuses, especially not for this house because this house is given everything to defeat the enemy and some. Man, we have got like a whole storehouse of arsenal to smash the enemy's head with. There's not one reason. I don't care what you have to do, where you have to go, how bad you think it is for you. There's no excuse for you to be a victim. There's no excuse for you to be a bad witness. Now, I know we go through things and, you know, we make mistakes. We have issues. We manifest from time to time or whatever. But there is a true heart of repentance. There is a true heart of asking an individual for forgiveness and apologizing. And then there's a turn from that. Amen? It's not a, I'm just going to keep on repeating this circle of doing the same thing over and over and asking forgiveness every time. It doesn't work that way. If it's happening that way, you need to get in your prayer closet and attack that thing until it's gone so that when you do repent and ask for forgiveness, it has no place anymore. Amen? And it's a constant deal. The Lord is constantly exposing things in our lives. He's bringing them to the surface. They're manifesting so that we can cut their heads off. The problem is, is people are comfortable with those things, and they're not cutting the heads of the serpents off. These things are coming to the top. They're getting exposed to where we can see them visually. People around us are helping us see them. Teachings here are helping us see them. God is helping us see them. The problem is, is people are not taking dominion and authority and chasing after their enemy consistently to cut the head off of it so that it can't infiltrate their life anymore. There's a lack of warfare. There's a lack of desire for warfare. The reason why people struggle is because they're not doing the things they're supposed to do. They're content with being lukewarm. They're happy to touch unclean things. They're fine with it. And that's a major problem. Some people don't really want to change. Some people aren't sick and tired of the old life. Some people are okay with just a little bit of the new. But I'm here to tell you, it won't last forever. It won't last forever. It may last for a little while for you, but you're going to fall. It's sad thing to say and not to speak evil over people's life, but the truth of the matter is, if you play games with God and you're playing with the devil, you're going to fall, period. I didn't write it. It's in this book. So you can't shoot me. It is a plan of escape. There is a message in this book that will deliver you from everything. There are tools that this ministry gives you and, and people all around the world through their bodies, they give them so that they are able to succeed in every area. The problem is we're not using them. So start using your tools. And stop playing games. Amen? Get fired up for the Lord, man. Get fired up, man. You know how tormenting it is out there. Wretched. Don't lose sight of that. Don't live in it, but don't lose sight of it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 8. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you repent and turn and you truly go after him with a heart, with fire, man, he will do everything you need. He will show up beyond measure. He will touch you in ways you didn't think you could ever be touched. He will bless you in ways you didn't ever think you could be blessed. He'll have you doing things you thought you were beyond too out of your mind to ever be a part of. It, it, it'll blow your mind. Believe me, it's, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. You know, I, I can only speak of my own testimonies, man, but the things I see God doing, I was telling my wife the other day, I was like, there's no other explanation. I mean, it is, it's God. It is God. It is always God. I am too stupid for that stuff. I know the decisions I made in my past. I know who I was in my past. I know where my mind was in the past. So the things that are happening now can only be him. That's the only excuse. That's the only reasoning behind it is Jesus has taken over my mind and has done some pretty awesome things, and I love it. And when I do something stupid, I know that wasn't him. I know he was there trying to tell me, don't do that, dummy. We all hear that saying sometimes, no, don't do that. Don't go over there. 
don't touch that. Probably shouldn't do that. Probably shouldn't say that. We hear it. You know you do. You know you do. The problem is we don't listen to that voice sometimes, and we do it anyway. We're going to make mistakes, but we need to make less mistakes every day. Amen? 1 Corinthians 8, 10 through 12. Hallelujah, for if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? So at this time, we're not talking about food. We're talking about what you're touching and agreeing with. If people see what you're touching and agreeing with and it doesn't line up with the character of Christ, it's going to lead them to think that it's okay to touch those things as well because they see you as a believer, or it's going to lead them to never listen to anything you say because they think you're an idiot and you're touching things you shouldn't be touching. You're going to ruin the witness and the character of Christ for somebody who had a chance to get rescued. So what are we touching and agreeing with that is going to be a stumbling block to somebody else? What are we touching and agreeing with in hiding that we think nobody sees, but I promise you, even if you're doing it in hiding, those fruits will manifest in front of somebody, even though you're not doing what you're doing and hiding out in public, it will manifest to somebody and they will see what you've got going on. You cannot hide it. I guarantee it, I promise it. You cannot hide it. Verse 11, and because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Hallelujah. So in this, what are you eating physically and spiritually? And you know, we talked about the spiritual end of it, and I'm going to talk to you about the food part of it. All right? So it is talking about eating and whatever. I know there's always multi, the, the word is multidimensional. There's always um, multi, multiple ways to look at different things that God is saying in the word. Um, and one of the things I've seen in my own life and in many other people around me is it doesn't matter how much you praise and worship. It doesn't matter how much you warfare. It doesn't matter how much you pray in tongues. It doesn't how much you connect with the Lord. If you are feeding your body garbage all the time, you will manifest bad fruit. Sugar and things that turn into sugar, like carbohydrates, if there is a constant eating and drinking of those things, you will manifest and probably ask, why am I doing this? There's so many things that I'm doing in the spirit. I'm going to church every week. I'm worshiping. I'm truly after the Lord. I've truly given him my heart. Well, you've truly given him your heart. Now he wants your temple clean. There are things that we need to stop eating and drinking that are hindering us from truly being in divine, divine connection with the spirit and that are hindering us from truly being a witness of the character of Christ. Because sugar affects your brain in a way where a lot of times you don't have control over your emotions and you don't have control over your tongue. Because if your emotions and your hormones are out of whack, your tongue is out of whack because you speak everything you think. You're always in a bad mood and you don't know why. I'm here to tell you why. If you have a divine connection with the Lord and you're still having problems manifesting, look at your diet. Look at what you're eating. Looking at what you're putting into your temple is going to save your life as well. It is a vital part. The body and the spirit run hand in hand with the kingdom of heaven. So that is something that you need to take, take very seriously. What am I putting in my mouth? What you eat is what you become. We know this. We hear this all the time. We need to start practicing it. And this is for people globally. You got people getting up there preaching with the the fire of the Lord and doing all this stuff, and they're five, six hundred pounds. It's like, dude, you know, pay attention to your health. People dying, I mean, people that are proclaimed prophets and teachers and preachers out there that are dying early, very early, because of health problems, heart disease, and different issues with their body that's brought on by terrible eating habits. So we need to make sure that we are taking care of our temples as well of taking care of our spiritual temple. Our physical temple and our spiritual temple run hand in hand. They will not operate separately. They run together. And in order to get the perfect will of God 
manifested to those that are in need. We have to have spiritual and physical in order. Amen? Hallelujah. So how do we get set free from a lukewarm spirit? How do we get ourselves on fire for God? Um, let's go to Matthew 5, verse 6. Starts with seeing that you have a problem. Starts with seeing that you need more Jesus. And that will bring you to a place of a true heart of repentance. To where you are sick and tired of what you've been doing. You're sick and tired of the witness that you've been. You want to do new things. You want to be made new. You want to ask for forgiveness. And you want to truly seek the Lord with everything you have. That is where we start. Repentance. And a true heart to seek him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You hunger and thirst after him, you seek him with everything you have, he will fill you up beyond measure and give you everything you need. He will cause you to be who you're supposed to be for the kingdom of heaven, for your brothers and sisters and those that are out there in need. Amen. It must start with a true heart of repentance and a true heart's desire for righteousness. There must be a true desire for righteousness or you will never be on fire. Some people don't want to be righteous. Some people are content with living the way they're living. This is an opportunity from the throne room of God today to take the invitation from the Lord to turn it all around and to get on fire for him and be who you've been called to be. John 4, 23. But the hour is coming, then it says, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's like, well, it's coming, but, but it's right now. Amen. It's, it's right now. It's here. It's in this time that we're standing in right now. So let's, let's read it again. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That means every time you have an opportunity to worship, you need to give your everything. It doesn't matter what's going on in your mind. It doesn't matter how your day was. It doesn't matter how tired you are. It doesn't matter how sick you feel. You show up and show out for him every time. Every time. No hands in the pockets, no arms folded like this, none of that nonsense, man. Everything he did for us, and we stand on the sideline and half-heartedly worship. Shame on us for not giving him everything. He has given us everything, everything. I don't know what your past is, but I know when I think about my past and what I have been set free from, I should get slapped in the face if I ever come in this house and don't give God my all. Probably more than that, but I'm just going to leave it at slapped in the face. Um, and I can't. I can't come in this house without worshiping my heart out. I just can't. I love him too much. I care about him too much. The majority of the time, I need a touch, man. <laughs> Every time I need a touch so that I don't kill somebody or do something stupid. Um, but in that, when you do that, he shows up every time. It doesn't matter if I feel sick. It doesn't matter if, if, I'm, if I'm tired. It doesn't matter if you know, my dad's in the hospital or my brother's in the hospital or my mom is whatever. It doesn't matter because it all goes away in his presence. Everything is in his presence. Everything changes in his presence. Man, I'm telling you, there was, I don't know, a week and a half ago, man, I was sick. I was sick, sick. I still had to go to work every day. I was sick, man. One of my bosses had surgery that week, so he was out, so I was the only one left in the field to run everybody. So I had to be there. I did not want to be there, but I had to be there. I missed church Tuesday night, and Friday I was still, I mean, I was sick, but there was, I knew in my spirit, if I didn't get to church, there was going to be a serious problem. And I came to church that Friday night, and I'm telling you, it was 
beyond measure blessed. I got so refreshed. I got so touched. I got so changed. It was mind-blowing, you know, and that's, that's the heart. If you ever feel like you don't want to go to service, it's because God has something for you, and the devil's trying to steal it. And the question you need to ask yourself is, who told you you don't want to go to church? Who told you you don't want to go worship? Vital question that we forget a lot of times that we need to be asking when we start sensing and feeling things like that, feeling things like that. Who told me that? Because I know every time I come here and I worship, change comes. Awesome things happen. Freedom comes. Blessing comes. And aside from that, I love to bless the Lord. He has done so much for me to date from my past, rescuing me, bringing me out of the pit, and things that just keep coming all the time. How could I not want to bless him? Don't forget where you came from. Don't get caught up in the lukewarm flesh nonsense and forget what he's done. Forget how he's helped you and forget who you truly are. Don't let the enemy sway you into that. Amen? Psalms 101, 7 through 8. David, this dude was a real deal soldier. I mean a real deal soldier. And, you know, for him, his warfare was a little bit different because he actually had to go out there on the battlefield in, in the natural realm and, like, swing a sword and, like, really fight people and really had a serious opportunity in the natural realm to literally get his head cut off, um, you know, and as well, always the Bible is multidimensional, so it's, he had a physical battle, but he also had a spiritual battle, but this dude lived both sides, you know, us personally, we do have a physical battle with ourselves, and we have the demons that are constantly trying to get us to get into the physical realm and cause us to do things and touch and agree with things that are going to bring harm and death to our body, um, but our warfare is in the spirit. It can be brought into the natural with things we allow to happen, but it's in the spirit. Amen? But what I love about David is no matter how hard it got, no matter what he was going through, no matter what the struggle was, no matter how crazy things were, his heart constantly cried out to the Lord. He was constantly in tune with his Father in heaven. He never took his eyes off of Jesus. Psalms 101, 7 through 8. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Now, there's, there's something about all this that is, is awesome. You know, we always have a choice every day. We are either victims or we're conquerors. That's our choice every single day, to be a victim or to be a conqueror. Complacency and laziness will lead you to a victim mentality, which is caused by a lukewarm spirit. Don't allow the enemy to drift you into a place where you become complacent and lazy, and you stop going after the enemy. That is vitally important that day in and day out, we cut the heads off of every demon from hell that tries to assassinate our destiny. And there needs to be a fire for you don't just get up and go through your prayers. And, uh, 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 bind, uh, bind, uh, uh. You need to be on fire to kill those demons because they're on fire to kill you. Plain and simple. The reason why you still struggle and you do 150 prayers in three days is because you're nonchalantly just, eh, well, I did my prayers. I did them. You know? No, you know better now. You know, it, it's one thing. You know, when you first come in, when you first come in to know the Lord, we're having you do prayers. You do your prayers because you're working at learning what it is. And through sowing those words, you begin to start severing and chopping all the old stuff off. But there comes a time when it takes root in you and you know the truth and now you're responsible for the truth. And if you don't get on fire to kill what is trying to kill you, you're done for. You're going to fall. The enemy is going to swallow you up. And that's the hard truth. Bottom line. We are responsible for our salvation, for our freedom. We are responsible for our destiny in the Lord. We have to take the action 
to seek the Lord with everything we have and to chase after our enemies with everything we have day in and day out. That's our responsibility. If you don't take the fight to them with all your heart, believe me, they're going to bring it to you. It's going to overwhelm you, and it's going to crush you. Take it serious. Don't be a nonchalant warrior because all that really is is somebody who is set up for failure. We're third-dimensional warriors. We kick the devil's butt. We're on fire to kick the devil's butt. It should be a sport. I think sometimes I try and be like a ravenous pit bull who's on a chain trying to get a way to go smash somebody or eat somebody. You know, and I'm like, Lord, just let me loose. Let me loose on them. You get up in your prayer time, and you go to war against those things. You see something that you're struggling with, don't just say, oh, man, I don't know why I'm struggling with this. I don't know why I'm dealing with it. Kill that thing. Go after it every day till it's gone. You have anger problems. You have lust problems. You have perversion problems. Whatever the problem is, see it, identify it, and go after it every single day until it can't come back, until it doesn't want to come back because it knows that this temple is no dwelling place for them because they got nothing but pain waiting for them. Amen? Hallelujah. We are not victims. There is no excuse for anybody in this place to say, woe is me. I have to deal with this. I have to deal with that. There's no excuse for anybody in the body of Christ to, to be able to say any of that stuff because we have been given everything. Psalms 18, 37 through 42. We need to get on fire, guys. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. In order to crush a lukewarm spirit, in order to crush a familiar spirit, in order to crush any spirit, there has to be a fire of God within you so strong that it consumes and burns up everything. There is nothing more important to you than being pleasing to the Father, to walking uprightly, to walking in righteousness, and to be the witness that you've been called to be for the kingdom. That must be your priority. And without it, you're going through the motions, and you're headed out the door. Don't let the enemy make you a victim. Excuse making day in and day out will cause you to be a victim. It will rob you of your fire, and you will be in a place of lukewarm. And the word says that it vomits out the lukewarm. It would rather you be cold than be lukewarm. But forget cold, forget lukewarm, be on fire. Amen? Thirty-seven through forty-two. I love this. What does it say? I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust. Before the wind, I cast them out like dirt in the streets. Hallelujah. This is how we need to be. We must be this way with our enemies. Now, I'm not talking about your brother or your sister. That's not what I'm talking about. You don't beat them to the dust and throw them out in the street. But there is a spiritual war going on. People get rescued, they get saved, and they go through things. Things are being exposed. You pray against the spirit. But you also make sure that you're mindful that you're not in judgment. A lot of times people are so busy judging other people and seeing the bad fruits that they're manifesting they're not paying attention to their own stinky fruit. You didn't come here so that you could point out everybody else's garbage and save them. You're not the judge. We are to judge fruit, but we don't allow the judgment of fruit to fall into judgment of the individual and cause us to come to a place where we are in the sin of judging other people instead of blessing them. There's a big difference in judging and in judging fruit. Amen? Judging comes with backbiting, slander, and pride. 
You're not looking at yourself and what you're going through. You're not seeing through the other individual's eyes. You're not looking in the spirit. You're looking at the individual. Judging the fruit is seeing the spiritual aspect of it and calling down fire on those demons, not in hatred towards the person, but in hatred towards the evil, knowing that you have just as many problems in your life that need to have fire called down on. Amen? So iron sharpens iron. We are a house together. We are a family, so we're going to sharpen each other. What somebody else does may bother this person. What this person does may bother that person. The thing you have to keep in mind, if you're bothered by anybody, it's because you have a problem. I'm not saying they don't have a problem as well. But if something bothers you from somebody else, there's something going on within you that you've got to search out. The Lord is trying to expose you, not use you to expose everybody else through your mouth. Amen? So be mindful of the things you're saying and doing and how you're treating other individuals based on their fruit. Prayer works miracles. Backbiting and slander works evil. Amen? Pursue your enemies and destroy them. Don't give up. Psalms 119, 25 through 33. You know how many believers I know and have talked to that have no idea whatsoever about any kind of warfare at all? None. They don't know anything about praying in the morning. They don't know anything about um, real true relationship. They don't know anything about warfare. They don't know anything about removing demons from themselves. So there's an area where we are called to bring that to other individuals. And that's another reason why it's vitally important that you grab a hold of what you're supposed to grab a hold of here. Because people come through here to get trained up, not only for themselves like we talked about, but so that you can go out into the world and bring truth and bring freedom and deliverance to other individuals. So take care of what you got to take care of and get right. Put it before the Lord, surrender it all. And let them cleanse you and heal you and get you free so you can be a demon butt kicker for you, your family, and for everybody else out there. And teach them how to be the same way. Amen. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Anybody ever felt like that? Like you're just like, Lord, please help me, man. <laughs> I, I just can't do this anymore. And he says, my soul clings to the dust. That is like a desperate cry for help. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So shall I meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O oh Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. He does not sound at all like he has got anything to do with a lukewarm spirit whatsoever. Though he is in pain, though he is struggling, Though he is going through hell on earth, he is on fire for the Lord. His trust is in the Lord. He knows that all he has to do is call on the Lord, trust on the Lord, rest in the Lord, wait on the Lord, and deliverance is coming. That is the mindset that we must have. A lot of times we go through things, and the first thing we do is get in the emotion, crying, why, why me, why this, why do I have to deal with this, why do I have to go here, why do I have to do that? Oh, it's so hard. Oh, my goodness. I can't deal with this stuff. Shut up. You have been through hell beyond measure out there as addicts, as, as individuals in the world, and even people that aren't addicts, just being out there in the world and in the sway of the wicked one, living in deception. That is complete misery and torment. Stop crying about your circumstances. They could be a million times worse. Think about individuals that are out there, little children that are used for sex slavery, women that are taken captive all the time, all over the world, to be used as prostitutes, shot up with drugs, kept, kept on drugs so that they could be used as prostitutes. People are being kidnapped. They're being smuggled. They're being abused. They're being tortured. 
They're being tormented day in and day out. And we're crying and whining about little stuff that goes on in our life. You have to be mindful of what's really going on out there in the world and get out of yourself and your little tiny little box that you have yourself in and you have God in. You've got to bust out of that thing and know that you're called to rescue those people that are out there really going through something. Because we ain't going through nothing compared to what people are dealing with out there. That's the reality of it. We are here in this place blessed beyond measure to stand up for those that can't stand up for themselves. And we're whining about stupid stuff. Come out, man. It's time to come out from it. And I'm talking to me too. There's things I deal with and have to come out from as well. I'm not a holier than thou individual up here talking to you. I got my own things I got to deal with as well. But I promise you I'm going to deal with them because I ain't going back to the old life and I will not be going before the Lord and hearing I don't know you. This person and that person and all these people missed out on what I had for them because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. I'm not going there. Let's step up and kick the devil's butt. Get out of ourselves. Stop whining and crying and be who God's called us to be. And we're going to close with Revelation 3. So we know that no matter what we go through and no matter how hard it seems, we must keep ourselves on fire. It is our responsibility. There are no excuses, no excuses for any one of us here to become lukewarm or to stay in a place of being lukewarm. We have the choice to be on fire or to not be. You go through it because it's your choice. If somebody chooses not to do what they're supposed to do, everybody's got to work out their own salvation. You can't allow what this person does to dictate what you do because you're accountable for you. You can't say, I left and I didn't receive what God had for me because this was going on over here and that was going on over there, so I, I, I fled. That will, not, that will not fly in the kingdom of God. There's no excuses. You have to work out your own salvation no matter what's going on around you. All right, Revelation 3, 14. You know, I take this, you know, for me as an invitation of, from the Lord, you know, a, a divine invitation from the Lord, him reaching his hand out and saying, I'm here for you. You have an opportunity. Take it. Grab a hold of it. Make everything of it. I will give you everything you need. I will supply you with everything you need. I will do the work that needs to be done in you. All you have to do is extend your hand out to me, grab a hold, and cooperate. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right. And to me, you know, for me when I see that, it's the body of Christ as a whole, man. The body of Christ as a whole, this ministry as a whole, God's people globally as a whole. These things I say, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold. This is the invitation. Refined in the fire, that you may be rich and, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will, grant to, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Amen, amen, and amen. Don't miss out. Don't miss the ride out. You cannot make it on the coattails of another individual. You have to purchase gold from the Father, refined in the fire. You have to go through your trials and tribulations and righteousness. Nobody else can do it for you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you and bless you, Father. We thank you for your word, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus over it, Father. We ask that it would grow and bear much fruit for your glory. Father, we thank you for the opportunities of repentance. We thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us, Lord. But we know that grace runs out for those that continually choose to walk away from you. We ask, Father, right now, today, that there would be a divine awakening to your people who are living unjustly, unrighteously, who are in agreement with things that are not of you, who have fallen into a place of lukewarm or who have never made it out of a place of lukewarm. We ask that a fire of God be released so mighty and powerful, Lord, that it consumes everything that the enemy would try and bring to any individual. I ask that you would grant people eyes to see the areas that need to be exposed so that they can pursue those enemies and cut the heads off of the demons, Lord, and get free so that they can seek you and bless you with everything they have. Father, we thank you that you continue to touch us and heal us and change us. And we just bless you today, Father. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you. Thank you.